So we are spending this time for final exam review, and I thought I would just start off with a very quick uh, list of topics. Not the full list, I'm just going to try to fit my list uh, on this corner here so that I don't have to erase it. So uh, let me just give you the biggest breakdown, the big, big breakdown of the final exam topics that you should be reviewing. And as a reminder, we don't, um, as a reminder, uh, we don't go back to thermodynamics. So anything we covered in thermodynamics, we don't go back to. By the way, um, I don't think you have to take any note. So, so let me just put the projector here. Um, so this final exam study guide is posted here. It uh, has uh, most of the reminders of the topics that you should know. It mostly refers to the previous study guides that you should look at. So these are the big topic breakdown of what may be covered on the final exam. Electrostatics. Magnetism. And um, I guess there's one category that I call um, electromagnetism. And I will just uh, explain what I put in the category. Electromagnetism. And the old guy out, which requires a different type of reasoning, different, you know, approaches is the circuits. And actually circuits have been kind of sprinkled throughout the semester. You had a circuit part of your exam two, and you had a circuit part of your exam three. And so now that we are at the final exam, we'll put all the circuit related stuff on its own together so that I can just uh, mention them all at once together. So that's the sort of the big category. and. Uh, within each of these categories, there are some big chunks that I, that I can mention that's worth mentioning. So in both dealing with electricity and magnetism, you are going to deal with some level of force. So you are going to deal with um, calculating um, um, forces and some level of kinematics that might come into as a result of dealing with these forces. Um, I guess, uh, so in electrostatics, that force is more or less trivial. It's, uh, you know, once you have electric field, so uh, once you have electric field, then calculating electric force is trivial. You multiply it by charge. And the kind of motion that results from the forces is also kind of simple in electrostatics. It ends up being something like a uniform acceleration, or it ends up being something like you would use conservation of energy to work out. Uh, where it gets more interesting is actually with the magnetism. This is where you might actually have to review some kinematics. And you might have missed the question on exam three uh, for that reason is it's because of the, um, the complic well, not complicated, complicated form of magnetic force. So magnetic force is something that you should make sure you understood it, or if you didn't for some reason, review it. And because of the features of magnetic force, it most naturally results in something that looks like a circular motion. Because you know, magnetic force, uh, I guess I can write it down here. Electromagnetic force is charge times electric field, which is trivial, not all that interesting, plus V cross B. And this cross product results in a very interesting features for the force. The force is always perpendicular to magnetic field. All right, doesn't really mean much. But it's also always perpendicular to velocity. And that results in the force naturally becoming a centripetal force. Because uh, when a particle is moving in one direction, magnetic force always acts perpendicular to it. So it always changes the direction of the trajectory, but doesn't ever speed it up or slow it down. 
So whenever you have magnetic field and a charged particle moving, it sort of naturally results in a circular motion. So, so let me call it magnetic force and um, circular motion. So this is where you might have to review some kinematics because there are some formulas and concepts related to the circular motion that um, you could have forgotten since physics 4A. So, all right, so that's a, a little bit of piece that might uh, tie back to physics 4A and what the sort of mechanics you are supposed to know. The rest is more, well, well, I'll just go through. So, so uh, the, let me go through the rest of the electromagnetism topics. So in electrostatics, there's an electric field. So there is how to calculate electric field. And um, ca you calculate the electric field either using Coulomb's law. That's when you're either mostly dealing with the point charges or you're dealing with a charge distribution that doesn't have quite enough symmetry. If we are in one of the three symmetric geometric situation, then you would use Gauss's law to find the electric field. And I would tell you that um, the topic that really a lot of people need to review is application of Gauss's law. It's, um, Coulomb's law, it's a uh, um, kind of tedious calculation. Um, I, I mean, I, I can believe that there are people here who don't know how to apply Coulomb's law to do the integral and all this stuff. So I don't mean to say that's easy. But this is what I mean. A lot of people really need to use, review Gauss's law. Is that Gauss's law, once you know how to use it, it can be really simple. It can be easy, but to too many of you here, because you didn't study, you don't never understood the argument, it's not easy for you. And this is something where you spend 30 minutes to an hour, focus the study, focusing on actually understanding what you are reading, you can actually get it. It's, uh, you know, the application of Coulomb's law where you have to, have to set up the integral and do the integral, it can be super complicated. And, um, if you can't get through that math now, then you know you have only one week to study and not enough time to get caught up on that. Fine, that's what, something that you would simply give up on at this point. If you're ever going to get it, or if you're going to get it this semester, you should have gotten it many weeks ago, not in the final week of the semester. But Gauss's law application, that's something that ought to be simple. I mean, I don't mean it's easy. It's uh, mathematically sophisticated. It does involve mathematically um, advanced argument. But once you get it, then it's, uh, it's really an easy calculation to do. So, um, so that's why I'm highlighting this as something that uh, people should uh, review. If you, don't, if you ne didn't learn this when you are studying for exam two, now learn it as you are studying for final exam. You will see it on final exam. Um, the last uh, set of sort of big topic we cover in electrostatics. So we dealt with the forces, the other physically important quantities, energy. So what we introduce is the things that deal with the energy, voltage. So this is the other um, big topic we covered in connection with the electrostatics. And because I'm limiting myself to this tiny space, I'm not able to list a bunch of other stuff, you know, like things dealing with the conductors, um, things dealing with uh, some particular special situations, all this stuff. Um, well, it should come up as you are studying electrostatics, like uh, electric field due to a dipole or things like that. Um, but I'm just. If I had to mention two words with electrostatics, it would be fields and voltage. <laughs> and everything else that we do somehow ties to one or the other. Good? OK, uh, let's move on to magnetism. So with the magnetism, it's also the same thing. The very first thing that I would mention is magnetic field. So like with um, electricity, where to calculate the electric field, we had Coulomb's law and Gauss's law. They were, they're kind of equivalent to each other. The difference is that um, one is more convenient in a limited set of situations. 
And if that fails, if this uh, convenient method fails, then you have to move on to brute force method. So with magnetism, magnetic field, it's the same thing. You have two methods. Uh, the brute force method that'll work all the time, except it's calculationally um, complicated. That's the Biot-Savart's law. And actually, I think a lot of people were doing this on the exam three. Um, you are using Biot-Savart's law to calculate the magnetic field of uh, due to a loop of current. That's a, that is a typical example of application of Biot-Savart's law. That's a situation where you see a magnetic field, but a loop of current does not have enough symmetry to use the next thing. So I, a lot of people are doing that on the exam. I guess the only reason I say this like uh, that's not the thing you should have done is that that question actually gave you the magnetic field. So you didn't have to waste your time recalculating something that was given in the problem. But you know, I might give you a problem where I'm asking you to calculate this, and I'm not giving you the answer. You have to do it um, yourself. So. Um, you, so you know, it's good that you know how to do it. You know how to use Biot-Savart's law for certain situations, and you know because it involves integral. In this class, you are not going to be tested on a really wide variety of geometries. I can't because you know you have limited amount of time during the exam. So, like with electricity, the other important thing is Ampere's law, and. I say the same thing for Ampere's law that I just said for Gauss's law, that people could really stand to review application of Ampere's law. Because once again, like with Gauss's law, it's not hard. It, uh, I mean, it involves sophisticated uh, argument and reasoning, and you know, it is advanced. It's not something that I would feel comfortable teaching in high school or middle school, unlike some of the things that we teach here. Um, Ampere, understanding Ampere's law does involve college level, does involve, well, uh, you know, actually, it's actually difficult to cover Ampere's law in algebra-based physics. It does involve a level of mathematical sophistication that only someone who was able to successfully pass calculus can understand. But once you understand that underlying concept and the argument, the actual calculation is super simple. And there's really no excuse for anyone here not to know how to apply Ampere's law. And I guess on the exam, sometimes I see this where people just write down set of, um, so this is, I guess, what I can say is what I see on the, so on exam three, that people were doing wrong. That uh, if you, this is how you plan on answering, then you are planning on losing a good chunk of the points. Is, wait, where did I? Okay, um, so it's essentially a version of the correct answer, except you are missing some key things. As in, uh, so this was one of the example of where you had to use Ampere's law, right? So the uh, uh, kind of an wrong answer I would see, you'd have all these mathematical expressions. You'd have this, 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 and this. And that's the only thing you would have. This is what I see as an indication of someone who actually did not understand the argument. And the only thing you did is you copied down these equations into your formula sheet, and you are just copying them from your formula card onto this. You do not get full credit for that answer. The most I would ever give for an answer like that is three out of five. If you, you know, if you are planning for that, then great. You are not planning to get an A or B. You are not, you know, you, know, you just want to pass and. I'm okay with that, actually. If you just want to pass, and that's the level of effort you are willing to put in, then do. I mean, I cannot change your goal for you. But if you are trying to actually do well, you need everything else that's here. The one key part that you really need to have, and that's a, this is the indication that you didn't understand the thing when you wrote down all the correct equations, if you don't have Amperian loop, that's an indication that whatever you wrote down, you actually didn't understand. Because there's no way you could write down any of this without actually having a loop in mind. And if you had a loop in mind, you better write it down so that I know what's it. I can't read your mind. I can only grade what's uh, written on the thing. So at a minimum, when you are applying Ampere's law, you have to use, have the Amperean loop drawn. Because you cannot apply Ampere's law without it. And really what I'm hoping for is that people would even write down these. I mean, I keep drawing analogies to English class here. 
It's because people come in with this mistaken understanding that all that physics is is math. It's not. There are a lot of good mathematicians who are terrible physicists because they don't understand the physical concepts that go into physics. And um, a good chunk of physics does have to involve using the English language or whatever language, but you know, this is class, I, I only understand English. <laughs> so um, you have to use some language to explain what you are doing. So um, ideally, you should be able to um, explain your line of reasoning in some, um, in some language other than mathematical equations. So, so this is what I mean when I say you should do a review Ampere's law. Both for Ampere's law and Gauss's law, your best resource will be portable TA. The portable TA has some examples of application of Gauss's law and application of Ampere's law. And those are problems are some of the longest uh, answers that the author writes. It's because you know, the proper explanation of steps actually does require a lot of words to explain. And the, what I'm telling you, you have to do if you are trying to do well, that you actually have to understand that argument so that you can reproduce some of it on the exam. So Ampere's law is the, the big, uh, one of the big thing in magnetism that everyone here should know. It's, uh, um, I guess, you know, by itself, you know, by itself, Gauss's law and Ampere's law, it doesn't look like there's a lot of application. It doesn't need to tie back into the forces to, for it to be useful in whatever you might be doing in research or engineering. Um, let's see, was there, I thought there was one more thing I should bring up with the magnetism. Like, it's a big piece that I cannot, not bring up. Mm. You have the magnetic field. Feel like I missed something. I, it might be that the, with the magnetism, the big thing is the force. That magnetic force is pretty complicated, so the particle path would look complicated. Let me make sure um, I didn't miss something because I'm pretty sure I didn't miss anything in the exam study guide. So let me look back at exam three study guide. Um, let's see, magnetism, magnetic field calculation. I guess that's it. Um, the, yeah, so the biggest the thing, oops. Um, the other big thing would be something that I already mentioned, the magnetic force. And you know, with the electricity, I don't really bring, uh, bring, um, bring a lot of attention to the electric force, and that's because I think it's kind of trivial. There's nothing interesting uh, dealing with the electric force. It's more or less what you would have expected intuitively. But magnetic force is not. The kind of motion that results in the um, kind of the path of the particles, that's something that actually requires a level of mathematical understanding to work out. Uh, one example of that was actually on exam three, which, um, so this is one question where I would say, um, it's not entirely your fault that you're not getting it. I uh, tried this question, I guess uh, two semesters so far, and very few people get it, and I, I'm hoping in a future semester to teach this class in a way where some people get it. So it's this question, part D, about magnetic bottle. And the first time I give, gave this question, I mistakenly thought this example was in Gian Colli. It's not. It's not an example in Gian Colli, so you could have been studying a lot, reading through the textbook, and still never have seen it. You had to have the correct textbook that's not here. Um, let me <laughs> get it. Uh, it's probably my office. Um, so I remember that example from the textbook. Okay, so I remember that example from the textbook that I studied my lower division physics out of. So that's why I thought, oh, that's a good standard example. Should be in John Colley. It's not. It's in this textbook. So if you are reading the correct textbook, then you would have seen it. Um, so you know, but you can still. So this all this means is that if you haven't seen the example before, then it's harder to get it on an exam. But 
I guess the go ideal goal I have is that you understand the magnetism well enough, you understand the magnetic force well enough that you can actually reason through it. That's where I was trying to give you some hint here. You know, it, assume that the initial velocity is mostly perpendicular, but there's a small component that's a parallel. So um, if this is the so this is the part that I drew in in the solution. Um, so this is maybe the initial velocity. And a lot of you got the fact that you know the force due to magnetic field will be perpendicular and it'll result in going in circle. The part that I'm hoping uh, some people will get at some point. So because this says um, component of velocity that's parallel, this uh, will this will actually go in some kind of a helical path. The helical path that some people got in the previous question here. That if you have a uh, particle that's moving at some angle, then it follows a path that looks like this, a helix. Okay? So as it follows that helical path, this will start to drift away in this direction. So the analysis you had to go through was something like this. What's the force on the particle as it's around this portion here, as it's about to drift out of the bottle? Then when you look at the force carefully, so this is the direction of magnetic field, force uh, on the particle when it's here, you would realize that the V cross B has a component that's pushing the particle backward, back towards the center of the uh, arrangement. And you know, I, I try this question every once so often and people don't get it, mainly because I think we need to have ha we need to, to have done more emphasis on the um, the the sort of result of the magnetic force. And um, so, but you know, that's more of a reminder for me in the future semester, but what doesn't change, what um, I'll still hold you to uh, for this semester still, so you know, I probably won't give this magnetic bottle question on the again on the final, I won't do that. But what you should know is how to work out the magnetic force for a particular case that's in the problem, that you know, using the right hand rule and cross product, and work out the consequence. What would be the particle path following that? Um, yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, let me leave it there. You have enough you know, homework questions. So th there is nothing that I would ask you on the final exam that's more difficult than what's already in your homework question for motion of a particle under magnetic force. Okay, so this is uh, um, so these are the two big groupings of topics where it's just uh, electricity alone, no magnetism, and this is sort of like magnetism alone, no electricity. There's no electric field anywhere here that we um, are bringing. Uh, there's a current because that's where magnetic field comes from, but that's where we limit ourselves to. The topics that I set aside as electromagnetism. And that is actually the proper way to refer to the theory that you have been learning uh, this semester because you, you saw on Monday that, the, um, that in Maxwell's equations that electricity and magnetism is blended into one coherent theory where you cannot describe electric fields properly without magnetic, uh, without mag uh, without magnetic fields, and you cannot describe magnetic fields properly without electric fields. So the very first uh, topic in elect what I'm calling electromagnetism would be um, Faraday's law. It's, uh, so that would be the very first thing, Faraday's law. The expression of Faraday's law actually says it all. It says that there's this uh, new kind of electric field that we hadn't seen before. New kind of electric field where if you integrate around a loop, you don't get zero, you get a non-zero quantity. It, uh, there's an induced voltage as you go around in a loop. And this induced voltage is related to magnetic field or change of magnetic flux. So this is uh, our, this was our introduction to electromagnetism. Uh, how you get something that's electric directly from something that's magnetic. So, so we have Faraday's law and um, I guess that's probably it. <laughs> um, there, so 
so this is not going to be a big part of your exam, but uh, so Maxwell's equations would fall under here. Maxwell's equations. And you know, as a physicist, uh, my dream would be that everyone would know what Maxwell's equation is, feel comfortable with what it is, and would have it printed on their t-shirt, um, which some people do. <laughs> but you know, we, get, we only get to introduce, introduce the entirety of Maxwell's equation only towards the very end. Because Faraday's law is the very last full equation we give to you. And actually, um, we waited until last Monday to introduce the last piece of Maxwell's equation. So, uh, so you know, I can't really focus a lot on Maxwell's equations, so I won't. One thing I can tell you is that I'm going to ask you to know that last piece we introduced on Monday. And if you want to look it up again, um, and I'll eventually post a video, is the key phrase that you want to know is displacement current. I mean, there's a whole story that goes with the displacement current, what it is, what role it plays. Read the textbook. <laughs> but the, that's the key phrase. You have to know what displacement current is. And that's the one part of uh, the chunk of stuff we covered on Monday that might be on your final exam. Because this is the last piece that's needed to wrap up the complete Maxwell's equations. This is a Maxwell's contribution. That's why we call the, all the equations that we are introducing throughout the semester. Gauss's law, Ampere's law, and Faraday's law as Maxwell's equations. We don't call them Gauss's equations. He has enough things named after him already, uh, if you take multivariable calculus. <laughs> um, so this, uh, this is electromagnetism. It's uh, all you know, fundamental physics, um, like basic nature. And uh, some limited applications, but um, I guess if you found a lot of this was very abstract and you are thinking, why am I learning this stuff? I'm a mechanical engineer. I'll never see this again. <laughs> then, then you know that's not entirely un unjustified. Um, so I, what I believe is the most uh, practical part of this class is actually circuits. I mean, even in circuits, you might still think, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm never going to deal with the circuits. That might also be true. <laughs> um, or, you know, I'm a civil engineer. I'll never deal with the circuits. Um, this is circuit stuff, it's more useful for people who are doing research. Because when you are doing research, you are going to be dealing with some type of uh, data taking apparatus. And most of that is electronics. Um, so you have to, if, so um, if you're a physics major, upper division physics major actually includes an electronics lab because it's so important for a, a physics research scientist to, to know about electronics. That's the basis of the, the data taking device. And you know, if you're an uh, X major, electrical engineering and computer science major, then this stuff wouldn't matter more. But, I, I think every engineer can um, know something about circuits that would help you in some aspect of your job at some point. Um, maybe not for every engineer, but uh, I think it's one of those things that everyone who's technically minded should know. So as far as the circuits go, we divide them into sort of a three big areas that um, those three big areas would have slightly different approaches to it, but there's some still common threads through it. So let me just name those three big areas. They would be DC circuits, time-dependent circuits, and AC circuits. Those are the three big sort of uh, uh, breakdowns of um, problems or situations that we would call circuits. Uh, DC circuits is what you saw in exam two, along with electrostatics. So, um, um, so DC circuits is that's where we introduced, for example, we introduced the Ohm's law here. And time dependent and AC circuits were uh, what you saw in exam three. And uh, this is where you get slight bit more complication. So both in time depend well, in starting with the time dependent circuit, you had to deal with a relationship between voltage and current that were inherently time dependent. In Ohm's law, they are not inherently time dependent. Voltage is proportional to current. So if 
voltage is constant, then current will be constant. That's what uh, DC circuit is, direct current circuit. But uh, in the time-dependent circuit, we introduced two more circuit components. We introduced the circuit components, uh, capacitors, and inductors. Uh, capacitors and inductors. And the relationship between voltage and current for capacitors and inductors work out in such a way that they always have to be time dependent. It involves a derivative somewhere. It involves an integral somewhere. So now, um, I don't want to, so there's a reason I'm putting circuits as its own category, just all in one. It's because they all share one common thread. It's that when you are analyzing circuit, you have one common standard approach you can use in analyzing any circuit. It doesn't matter if it's DC or if it's time dependent or AC. So if you are analyzing a circuit from scratch, your starting point for any of those would be Kirchhoff's rules. And we spent a lot more time with these rules when we were doing DC circuit with the loop rule and the junction rule. And you know, this is the uh, standard strategy for circuits. When you see a circuit that you have never seen before and you want, need to analyze it from scratch, you do it by application of Kirchhoff's rules. So, so for exam three, we didn't emphasize it all that much. You kind of have to know the loop rule to set up the differential equation that comes out of the capacitor and inductor circuit. Um, but now that we are doing final, we might go back to DC circuit. You might want to brush up on op application of Kirchhoff's rules, especially as it relates to junction rule. Um, and you know, those system of two or three, maybe even up to five equations <laughs> that you need to be able to set up and maybe solve. Um, you know, I do realize your final is only two hours long, so when the question is written, it'll have that understanding in mind. I'm not going to expect you to set up a linear system of equations of seven equations and solve it <laughs> in the time you have. But you know, I might actually expect you to be able to set it up. Setting it up actually doesn't take all that much time. When you have system of seven equations, um, you can actually set it up with a careful application of Kirchhoff's rules. It's the solving portion that'll take way too long for you to actually do it in two hours. Um, so, but, so you should know application of Kirchhoff's rules. Um, AC circuit, I, it could have gone with a time dependent circuit. But the reason I want to separate time dependent circuit from AC circuit is because your approach to solving it is different. With a time dependent circuit, it's a very straightforward, a uh, step-by-step -step way of solving it. As in, you set up your Kirchhoff's loop rule equation that has uh, first order derivatives or things like that in it, and you can actually solve it using the standard method you learned in calculus. You use the separation of variables, and you go through it step-by-step. -step. Um, everyone here should know how to use separation of variable to solve an RC circuit or LR circuit. Like, so that's uh, how you approach time-dependent circuit. AC circuit, it's a little bit different. It's, uh, um, so um, you could be talking about, so when I say AC, you could be talking about a driven AC circuit, or you, driven, or you could be talking about just an LC circuit, inductor capacitor circuit. So a driven circuit is AC because you are applying a voltage at an oscillating voltage. So you are forcing it to oscillate, all right, it oscillates. LC circuit would be where you have an oscillator in your circuit. So if you charge it up and you just let it go, then it sort of oscillates on its own. In both of these cases, uh, you had to guess a solution. We, at our current level of mathematical sophistication, None of us, actually including me because I've, it's been a while since I've done it, none of us had the tools to solve this uh, directly. We instead guessed the solution. We guessed the sinusoidal answer, plug it in, get an answer. That's how we got the net um, oscillation frequency for LC circuit. So, um, so you know, it's a different solution approach. You should know how to use it. Now, and when it comes to driven AC circuit, one particular mathematical tool that I introduced will help. This is where you might want to review complex ex impedances. I don't know how much of that I would have put on the final exam. I already put fair amount on your exam three, which a lot of you got. 
um, because it's the same question I gave you twice. <laughs> but you know, um, so I guess what I would say is that do review complex impedance. Um, I don't want to put on as much importance on complex impedance as I put on Gauss's law and Ampere's law, as in my standard is that everyone going through this class should know Gauss's law and Ampere's law. If you know half of you didn't learn anything about complex impedance, I'm actually not, I'm okay with it. Complex impedance is something that people properly learn when you are dealing with a lot of circuits, when you take an upper division circuits class um, for some reason. Um, so you know, if you don't end up learning it, then I, I'm actually okay with it because it's not a part of the standard curriculum for this class. But it's one of those things where it's like, uh, people call it life hack. Um, this is the circuit or physics hack. It's where it's a, such a small thing, once you understood it, that it would allow you to do analyze something that's way more complicated than what uh, you ought to be able to do at your current level of understanding. Um, I guess here's one way to put it. You, uh, if th those of you who are reading through the textbook, you might have read the description of the phasers, um, the impedances, or the reactances of inductor and capacitor, and how uh, you get the impedance, and how that's represented on the phasor diagram, how they are combined in series and parallel. As you are reading through it, if you find yourself like you weren't really following it, I completely sympathize. I didn't follow it when I was looking at it. And in fact, even today, I don't never go back to that phasor diagram. It's this complex representation that'll make a sense of it. And the proper way to understand the phasor diagram is as a representation of the complex number in the complex plane. Like, that's how, it, so you know, in the text, it looks so tortured because there's one right way to say it, say that this is complex impedance, and they're trying so hard not to say the word complex. That's why it looks so tortured and geometric. Um, so anyway, so these are the four big topic areas. I would say they are probably all about equally important. Um, so you know, without committing to any particular distribution of questions, if uh, um, you know, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, that's probably ballpark distribution. As in, I'm not going to say circuit is you know, less than 10%, no. It's uh, about fourth as important. On the other hand, um, if, you, you know, if you felt completely lost on circuit, so let's say you gave up, then if you're doing well enough on the rest, you should still be able to do reasonably well. As in, you know, these cover 75%, so if you got 80% of that, you are at least a passing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's a final exam, it's a cumulative final exam, so um, the expectation is that um, you uh, have a well-rounded knowledge of what we covered in this class, minus thermodynamics. I don't care about thermodynamics. Um, so, um, so, um, so, so in terms of uh, study or device, I just say focus on what you felt you were weak on. Uh, focus on, um, go back to your past exams. So all your, all the exam answers are now posted. I realized I didn't post this until today, <laughs> but it's now posted. Exam two answer has been posted for a long time. And you know what you got on the exam, you know what you missed, you have all the information. And what I would say is that um, in particular, review the questions that you missed, in particular for multiple choice. I told you on Monday that what I did the last semester for multiple choice portion of final exam is I, um, so that would be the multiple choice portion of this uh, posted. Uh, sample exam was I just looked at my exam data. I don't know if you guys knew, uh, I probably know. I uh, record the data on a, at a question level. So um, I, all, for all my exams, I know that you know, a particular question given on a particular exam, 30% um, of you missed it or 60% of you missed it. So what I did for this semester is I just went through all the midterm questions and got which questions people, you know, more than half of the class missed and put those on the final. I probably won't do the exact same thing. I will probably write some new questions for your final, but um, I'm probably gonna fill up a good chunk of it with the multiple choice questions that people are missing 
So the I mean, I think this is an advice that ought to apply to all your classes. So you cannot expect to get everything. It's uh, impossible. As of you know, first time going through a class, like those standards never is that you are going to get everything. Like I don't get everything myself when I'm going through a class for the first time. But a standard that I would put for myself, and I think you should put for yourself, is that you never miss the same thing twice. If you missed something once on something that's consequential like an exam, then if you miss it a second time, at that point you are just broadcasting to the world. I don't care, I'm not putting in the effort. I don't care if I miss the same thing three, four, five, ten times. So at a minimum, if you consider yourself a good, good student, if you consider yourself a good student, you should at a minimum put this level of standard for yourself. You never miss the same thing twice. Because the first time you missed it, you put in enough effort to understand it then. And um, so that's a, one advice I would give in terms of studying. So, you know, it, so in terms of what you focus on, it all depends on uh, where you are. Um, my expectation is that a lot of people should have um, felt com comfortable with the electrostatics because concept-wise it's actually easier than magnetism. But in your specific case, it might be that you were slacking off and not studying all that much when we were doing electrostatics. You, so you might have to actually review them more. So in the case, you know, go review them more, go um, uh, put enough amount of time studying that. Um, um, and magnetism is the one that I think is out to be difficult, more difficult for everyone. Um, and you know, if it is, then do go study, the, especially the magnetic force. And, um, and electromagnetism is where I might ask more conceptual question than usual. In fact, that is something I did on um, the last semester's final exam, and I thought that worked out okay. Oops, that's the wrong. Um, oops, oops. Um, I thought that worked out okay. So this was the last semester's final, and um, this was a question I asked. And it's, uh, um, it's essentially entirely conceptual. None of these are heavy calculation questions. Um, and um, I will probably write something different for this semester. But um, but I think this uh, this electromagnetic induction is where uh, we are introducing something that is can be conceptually described, but to actually understand it, it requires a mathematical background. So I wouldn't try to explain electromagnetic induction to my conceptual physics class because it's too difficult to talk about without any math. But this, um, so I, so, so you, you know, this is the place where I can ask more conceptual questions. Um, or uh, you are asked to explain something, and the explanation is not writing down a series of equations, it's uh, explaining in English how something's happening. Actually, you have an example of that. With the Faraday's law, we have something called the Lenz's law. It's an entire sentence that's uh, dedicated to explaining this minus sign here. So, um, but you know, to explain Lenz's law, someone needed to have understood all this right-hand rule stuff. Need to have understood the Bios of Arts law. So uh, that's an example of uh, sort of what I mean by conceptual question. Okay. Um, and circuit, it's its own thing. So <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess uh, if you think feel like you've gotten circuits so far, then you know that's good. Uh, keep um, just review at some level so that you are not forgetting stuff. But I, I'm trying to think of someone who felt like they were lost on circuits so far, and I don't know if I have a good advice uh, for if you have just one week of time to study. You can always review the uh, past exam questions. Um, I guess with the DC circuit, uh, so with the level of complicated arrangements I can give on DC circuit, this is probably something that's uh, better given up than trying to get caught up because it's, uh, it's like the standard the strategy. You know, when we did cover the standard strategy in physics 4A, we spent uh, you know, three weeks, or th we spent a fair amount of time on it. If you are trying to cram, 
it's not something you can cram. It, you have to say, don't forget about cramming. Just focus on conservation of energy and momentum. <laughs> um, uh, what I would tell you is that time dependent and AC circuits are something you can cram because it's so advanced. I'm not going to have a sort of a huge variety of questions where um, I, I'm expecting you to um, apply a standard approach to it. There's a limited set of arrangements of time-dependent and AC circuits I can give you. And in fact, those limited arrangements are all represented in the homework questions you have seen. So, so that's uh, what I would tell you to review. If you want to review some aspect of circuits, especially the time-dependent and AC circuits, all of that is covered in homework. Let's see, is this here? Yeah, so chapter 30 homework. Um, inductor in circuit. Um, so um, this is an LRC circuit. And um, sorry, uh, let's see. Ah, these are, so, um, so this applies more for AC circuit. For AC circuit, this is really at the level, um, or like in test on, you know, filters, low pass filter, high pass filter, and uh, band pass filter. So th these would be application of complex impedance. So, you know, if you're trying to brush up on AC circuit, um, these three questions more or less cover everything I can ask on AC circuit. There's nothing I can reasonably ask on AC circuit in this class that will be outside of this. Time dependent, I guess, okay, you do have to study more because uh, there are more questions here. So, um, all right, so I think that's a brief-ish overview of topics. Um, Let's take the break now, and when we come back from break at, let's say, around the 2 o'clock or maybe a little bit later, um, I will try to go over any questions you have. So maybe there's an exam question that you missed, you looked at the solution, but solution didn't make sense also. <laughs> um, then um, we can go over that. So if it, there's any particular topic, maybe something that I mentioned here that you felt like you haven't understood it, um, this is another chance for me to try to explain it again. Maybe the second time it'll be easier to understand. So, so let's come back in a little bit and we'll, uh, I will try to answer any questions you have. <laughs>